All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. Thank you very much for the invitation. Very happy to be here today. This in the end, this works better. All right. Um, my name is Julian Klaus. I'm in charge of the technologies, uh, technology office here in Korea, as well as the BMW startup garage. And I'm here uh, today to talk in particular about the open innovation program of the BMW startup garage. So before I talk about the startup garage in particular, let me give you a little bit of context. This is the R&D center of BMW in Munich in Germany. Um, it's a fairly big campus. It's one of several campuses in Munich, um, but this alone hosts about 26,000 engineers. And um, it is, you can, you can really say, it's an R&D center where for every screw in the car we have a particular engineer. Now, at the same time, BMW has set a strategy called ACES, which stands for Autonomous, Connected, Electrified, and Services. And when you look at this, you may see that this does not really seem like the classical approach of an automotive manufacturer. Um, so that also poses a lot of challenges uh, with, for our engineers. This is why we want to make sure that we open ourselves for innovation coming from the outside and know that we cannot invent everything ourselves and also need to look beyond, beyond our existing tier one supplier landscape. So for the open innovation, we have actually several approaches. BMW Startup Garage is one of it. Um, and to, we want to make sure that we really harness the innovation power of all the different uh, external innovations that there are, which may be startups, which is why we're, here all, why we're all here today, um, but also across um, different industries, so not classical automotive industries, for example. Um, universities, research institutes uh, are a very, very big source for us. And also something uh, called intrapreneurs, so um, teams within BMW that have a great idea that then may um, create a new company. Um, so to do this, we have, as I said, the startup garage. I will tell you in detail about it later. And the technology offices in different locations worldwide. But also things like the crowd innovation um, program, which is um, a program where we crowdsource the solution finding for problems. So we ask internally and we ask externally. Um, we ask internally and ask externally um, about ideas to solve certain problems. I do hear a little bit of some other's voice. Uh, that's not me, that's not my video, so uh, don't get distracted. Um, another program is the accelerator program. So this is the counter approach. In this case, if an uh, entrepreneur uh, or an entrepreneur to be inside BMW does have an exciting idea, then um, he can apply for the accelerator program and we give him time and resources to um, go further through with this idea and potentially even establish an own company afterwards. All of this is to support our internal our internal business units, so we call them really internal clients. Now the Startup Garage is a program that was created in 2015 to then really work with external startups. And there's one important thing when, when you hear a, a Startup Garage, you may think, ah, this sounds like a co-working space, this sounds like an accelerator, and it's not. So the Startup Garage is not an accelerator program in the classical sense. We call it a venture client unit. So venture client really means we, are, we want to become clients of startups. We want to purchase prototypes from startups and become a customer, which is something that's usually not very easy. So for the startup garage, um, we don't only look at technologies that go into the car here under the number two. Um, but also in terms of mobility services, a lot we work with startups and even business processes, whether it be HR, whether it be production. Literally, if there's a connection, uh, connecting point between the startup service or the startup's product and the, any department of the BMW group, it can run through the BMW startup garage. So we founded it in 2015 and uh, in 2018 we started branching out internationally to do this um, with, um, of course, in every corporate, always limited resources. We uh, use the local technology offices. So that's why I earlier said I'm also in charge of the technology office. Uh, we have some of these tech offices here in Seoul, in Tokyo, in Shanghai, and uh, in Mountain View, California. 
And um, we actually just founded one in Tel Aviv. Uh, the, the big news about this will be out later, later this year. Oops, before this goes on, just a second. Um, so I will tell you a little bit more about the, uh, uh, the way of a startup to find its way into the BMW startup garage. But to do so, I would like to um, start with a little video, which already gives you the gist of it. Congrats, you made it, almost. You started a company, you have a product or service that transforms the automotive industry. You have a great team. You even graduated from a leading accelerator or got capital from top investors. What now? What's most important to your success? Clients, right? But not Denny. You want a leading client, one with top products and services and a powerful brand. Above all, you want a client who ventures to adopt your solution early, even if it is still a prototype. One who helps you validate and refine your solution. We want to be your venture client, your early adapter in the automotive industry. For this, we created the BMW Startup Garage, your gateway into the global trillion dollar mobility market. How? We offer a no strings attached partnership. Our goal, to integrate and apply your solution in real innovation projects. Beyond providing you with smart revenue, we provide you with resources right at the BMW headquarters. We give you direct access to our cars, tools, and above all, the world's best engineers. We also help you network with BMW and with our suppliers. Why does BMW do this? Because your startup can make a significant contribution to help us build the world's best premium mobility solutions. It's that simple. What do you think? Intrigued? Go to bmwstartupgarage.com to learn about our program. I have to wait for this. Um, so, <laughs> CI and everything, right? Um, so there's a lot of key messages in this video, but it's, um, it's maybe a little bit uh, too much information to digest um, within two minutes. So I want to highlight a couple of the key points here, really. Um, BMW wants to become a client. Why do we do this? Because usually it's very difficult for corporate to interact with the staff uh, in, in terms of the simple purchasing processes even or seemingly simple purchasing processes. To purchase something from a startup, the startup needs to have a, per uh, a supplier number within the BMW group and so on. It really takes a long time and a lot of effort to get this. So we simplified this uh, through the startup garage. And um, this way we are able to fund prototyping projects um, without, and that's the whole point here, without any strings attached for the startup. Unlike an accelerator that invests and takes a certain equity, we do not, take any equity in the startup, but we also don't take exclusivity for the technology that is being worked on with us uh, at this point in the startup garage program. Also, any IP rights remain totally with the startup. So in this case, really, it's nothing but uh, um, a client and a supplier relationship. For this, um, however, there are some, some risks for us. We know that, and that's why it's a venture client. Um, the program itself is aimed to be a four-month program, and it's not a batch program. So it's, it's uh, rotating over the year, completely rolling, and whenever there is a, a potential um, with, with a department, a customer department within BMW, we are ready to start this. Um, however, within these four months, um, of course, the main activity shall be preparing the POC project. But we also have other modules as part of these four months, one being the learn module. Learn for us here means learn about BMW for the next steps. Once the, once the proof of concept is done, eventually the startup, if it wants to work directly with us or with one of our suppliers, they need to understand how the automotive industry works. They need to understand how the, the purchasing processes work. They need to know what they need to prepare to really be ready for us. And we want to teach them uh, this in sessions back in Germany. Um, Networking is very essential within BMW, of course, as well. When you work on a technology, you want to have access to all the engineers, the experts that work with it to um, improve your technology and also, if it's not automotive, uh, originally intended, to get it better um, uh, tailored to the automotive industry. And for that whole purpose, of course, find selling opportunities within BMW. Very often, technologies that we work with are not exclusively interesting for one singular department, but may be very uh, interesting for different departments and therefore have different project opportunities. 
Um, eventually, at the end of the program, stands the transfer, and then, as I mentioned before, this may be into the products, into our services, or into our processes. I want to close with a couple of KPIs. So um, we started in 2015 here in Korea. Um, we began promoting this in uh, October, no, September 2018. And um, so far, through the Start Garage program, more than 60 startups have, um, uh, have gone through the entire program. And more than 50% are able to develop follow-up projects with us afterwards. Even Three startup technologies are already in serious production. Now, why am I highlighting this? This may seem to you like a, slow, uh, like a small number, but the development processes in the automotive industry are very long. We usually talk about six, seven years, and um, we only started the startup garage in 2015, so this is a big success for us. Um, very often the questions come up, and this is the, the last thing I want to mention, very often the question come up, comes up, what startups are you working with? Now, this is something we usually do not communicate. Um, the reason for this is because we take no exclusivity and because we invest a lot in uh, finding these startups and qualifying these startups for us, at this point we have no interest in communicating who we're doing POC projects with because at that point we're doing work for other companies as well. Um, nevertheless, there are a couple of companies that we officially communicate uh, by now and I'm really looking forward in the future to have a couple of Korean partners as well. They are right now filling up the funnel as well, and uh, we have lots of exciting startup collaborations coming up. With this, I'm done, and I'm looking forward to the speeches of uh, Bayersdorf and Airbus next. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julian, for introducing the startup business of the BMW. Moving on, we have from uh, the Bayersdorf, Jacek, I'm sorry, I'm not really sure if I'm going to pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Jessek Bronzda, is that correct? Okay, and also we have Dirk Plaz, am I correct? Please invite the both of them with a big hands of applause. <laughs> and as they come up, let me make the announcement one more time. Please log on to slido.com by D662 to leave any comments. Thank you. Yeah, hello, and thanks for the invitation. Um, thanks for having us here, or having me here. Um, my name is Dirk Ploss. I'm head of the Global Digital Technology Scouting and Advisory Unit of Biasdorf. And I want to give you a little introduction in what we do and why we do it um, in the way that we do it with startups all over the world. So, first of all, um, hold on. First of all, um, a little introduction about Biostorf because usually nobody knows our company. You all know our brands, I promise that, but you don't know the company. Um, secondly, a little bit why we do this, the reason to be, our challenges. And third, um, the strategic implications. Then a bit how we do it, it's the Annex Lab, I can say that so already. And our innovation ecosystems and the major success factors. After that, my colleague Jacek will um, show you how we, will, uh, how we implement this in a specific country with a specific um, approach. So these are our brands, and among those are uh, one of the most popular brands worldwide, like Nivea. Nivea is uh, known by roughly 98% of the world's population so far. We are active in more than 170 countries. And of course, we do have other brands like La Prairie, for example, which is the most expensive skincare brand in the world. So we can uh, roughly claim that we are the number one skincare company in the world. And um, it's not only that, we are a true legacy company. Founded in 1882, we call ourselves sometimes Hamburg's or Germany's oldest startup uh, because we still have the spirit of a startup, but we are already one, 137 years old. So um, this is the really um, definition of a legacy company. Um, we have more than 500 million consumers worldwide and we are producing um, most of our products totally including the packaging material. So even the metal tins that you purchase a Nivea tin in um, will be pr uh, produced by us. As I said, we're active in 170 countries and are market leader in almost 50 of them. And uh, our net worth right now is roughly 27 billion US dollars. Um, growing 5% year over year, that's a little bit above market, so we are still a very healthy company. 
And um, what's important to know about Biostoff and why we do all these startup activities is because we have a legacy in innovation. So we started uh, basically uh, with our founding 1882. In 1900, another, um, the, the first product in skincare was invented, Eucerit. Uh, in 1909, it was Labello, the first lipstick. Yeah, in some markets of the world, you will never um, ask for a uh, fat lipstick or a caring lipstick. You will ask for a Labello. Um, so it has become really a category name. Um, in 1975, we invented the sun protection factor. Well, not little known to many, um, but this was also a Biostorp invention. Uh, in 2011, it was the black and white deal, the first deal that will not leave any stains on your clothes. And we repeated that with sunscreen in 2017. So we have always been striving for innovation. We have always fostering innovation in our company history. Nevertheless, there are some big challenges ahead. So um, one of the biggest challenges is the rise of the indie brands that we have seen over the past few years. JD.com alone lists more than 3,600 skincare brands, not SKUs, not stock keeping units or single products, but brands with a multiple of products behind this. And of course, each of them are microscopic when it comes to market share. But 3,600 times a microscopic market share is something that really hurts our market share in specific markets. Um, secondly, uh, we see a big change in consumer behavior. They are using new information channels, aka the internet. They're using new shopping channels like e-commerce. Um, they have new demands like um, same day delivery or next day delivery. And of course, they have new influences. Uh, roughly 60% of all purchases in our category are already influenced by ratings and reviews. So this is something that we didn't have 10 years before. Uh, and we have to adopt to that um, with our strategies. And what's more, we don't know what will be coming ahead in the next 10 to 15 years. So we are pretty sure that there will be some sort of disruption to our industry as well. But will it be intense focus ultrasound, the skincare pill, 3D printing of um, uh, human skin or cold plasma? We don't know, but we are pretty damn sure that we will be disrupted. So we have to reinvent our own business model today to make ourselves future-proof. And in order to be prepared for an unknown but super fast arriving future, we uh, found a strategy that we say, okay, we have to do three things. Work with startups, the venture clienting model we just heard about, invest in startups so that we stay, uh, take minor um, uh, stakes in, in startups. We just set up a 50 million uh, corporate venture capital fund um, earlier this year and learn from startups. Because of course, as a big corporation with more than 20,000 employees, you tend to be not really that fast. Huh? You're rather a bit slow mover. So we have to learn again how to innovate and iterate very, very fast. So um, what we then did was to found the Annex Lab. This is the unit that I'm uh, leading. And we have on a global scale three uh, main responsibilities. The first is targeted and open scouting of startups. So I attend conferences like these, walk around and talk to startups and try to network and build our and grow our database of um, global startups that we can either work with or invest in. Secondly, we have um, the prototyping of new consumer technologies like build an Alexa skill for the Amazon Echo or experiment with augmented reality. This is happening in my department as well. And finally, we are developing own digital business models that necessarily don't have to do anything with skincare anymore. For example, we developed and um, uh, brought to market an app earlier this year that digitizes the communication between parents and kindergarten teachers. Now, this has had a lot to do with care, but not so much with skincare anymore. So we are shifting our own business model step by step into the digital sectors as well. And this is basically the um, innovation ecosystem that we have built and how we set up our own business and bring that strategy to life. In the center, you see the Annex Lab, uh, the department or team that I was just talking about. And then we have, of course, all the collaborations going on with the countries and categories. So we see ourselves more as a service function, a supplier, and somebody you can approach to and ask um, if we can find a solution in the startup ecosystem if you have a specific business problem, either in one of our countries or in one of our categories. Secondly, we are doing um, most of the scouting for the corporate VC activities. We have a sister department in our research and development. 
um, arm um, that is also doing par um, uh, part of the scouting, but for digital technologies, it's our part. And of course, we work together with e external VCs, because usually as a corporate VC, you are not the lead investor in any given round, but you are more a following investor. So we have to collaborate with a lot of VCs over the world. On the other side of the um, circle, you see the entrepreneurship program we are building right now. Same as BMW, um, we see that we can uh, foster and harvest um, all the good ideas of our 20,000 employees better if we put them in a specific dedicated prog program with ring fence resources. And we work together with external company builders where we have identified a specific business problem that is not yet solved by any given or existing startup. We hire external company builders to build those startups for us. And finally, we work together with a lot of accelerators like Techstars, the next commerce accelerator in Germany, um, and uh, of course our own accelerator that you will hear about in a couple of minutes, um, usually especially to um, foster the deal flow, because these accelerators serve as a perfect filter to our ecosystem. When we look into the different verticals that we are collaborating with, which is not only related to skincare, but can be marketing tech, advertising tech, health tech even, we have to see um, that we cannot do the scouting all by ourselves. Huh? But all the accelerators worldwide are doing an excellent job in doing um, that uh, selection process. And so we can then just work together with them, collaborate with them, and live from their output um, in, in our uh, own startup uh, scouting. Okay, final word um, is not from me, but from Wayne Gretzky, a famous ice hockey player, who said, um, don't go where the puck is, go where it will be next. And this is specifically true to innovations. We don't know where the next innovation will happen, where it will come from, especially geographically. It might come from Tel Aviv, it might come from the Silicon Valley, but it might come from somewhere else that we don't have on our list uh, yet. So this is why we are uh, trying to build a real global ecosystem with strong scouting units in each and every um, hub that we have identified so far. And one of the biggest and most important hubs for us is South Korea, because this is the one that is closest to our core industry of skincare and personal care. And what we are doing there is now presented to you by my dear colleague, Jacek Roth. Okay, welcome everyone. Hello, my name is Jacek and I'm living in Korea now for two years. I love kimchi, soju and uh, Tongatsu is one of my favorite dishes. I think it's actually Japanese, um, never mind. Good, so I'm going to talk today about uh, NX. And the idea is, and that's why we're also here together, Dirk is representative of Headquarter and showed you our global strategy. And I'm here from the market perspective to show you execution. NX is an independent brand and stands for Nivea Accelerator, right? And um, we already thought a lot about this, what would be the nicest name for this program? Why don't call it Bayersdorf Accelerator? Um, yes, we tried that. I was in some events, I introduced myself. Hello, I'm from Bayersdorf there. Who? Bayersdorf? You mean Beersdorf? Right, and um, that's not a good connection you wanna have. So what I noticed though was when I handed over this little tin, people really fell in love, right? It opened emotions, it opens the heart, it opens trust. And by giving the Nivea tin, people can really relate to us and know we are skincare. We are the number one skincare brand in the world. And that's why we choose the name Nivea Accelerator. Good. So um, one of the second question I got the most is why do you start this program in Korea, right? Usually if you're in a corporate accelerator, you would do it in your headquarter country, closest to your functions. All right, so what we believe is that the future of skincare is not in Germany, to be honest. We believe it is here. And the reason for this is what I believe a very unique ecosystem that has three overlapping areas, which you cannot find anywhere else in the world. I give you an example. First, beauty ecosystem. Korea is the third largest exporter of beauty products, over 500 face care brands, not products, face care brands, and over 2,000 suppliers. 
This is amazing. There's no other country such a strong beauty ecosystem. But in addition, you also have technology, right? Samsung, LG, many engineers, the fastest internet in the world. This is also a very strong factor of Korea. And startups, right? We all hear this amazing conference. Um, there are, some statistics say, over 30,000 startups in Korea. Um, I mean, there's a lot of government support, all kinds of venture capitalists, so the ecosystem is amazing. And when you put all of this together and look at this overlap, you only find it here. If you go to Berlin, you will find a startup ecosystem, but not a tech or beauty ecosystem. If you go to San Francisco, you will find a tech and a startup ecosystem, but not a beauty ecosystem. For example, I met some startup CEOs and they got accepted to a San Francisco accelerator, one of the most prestigious in the world, and they didn't go. They say, why should I go to San Francisco? If I want to do beauty, I have to be here, because this is the capital of skincare. And that's why we say for us as Biostoff, this is an amazing opportunity. This country is a unique ecosystem, and uh, as our board member says, we want to be where the future of skincare begins. Good. So this is a bit about why we started this, and next I will talk about how we executed it. And uh, we just opened one month ago, so it's very new, but I'm going to show you exclusive, all kinds of images to give you a bit of inspiration. This is um, very important. I think usually if you would ask an accelerator what is their strategy, they will come with KPIs and you know, all kinds of financials they want to achieve, having a batch of 10 every three months and so on. We believe the best strategy is CARE. CARE is our global strategy, it's CARE plus. CARE is part of our philosophy for over 100 years, and we are confident that by Showing care, it's the best strategy to make this program successful. And I will give you some examples. First, caring for the ecosystem. So caring for the partners in the market. When I came here, we haven't started anything, right? So I just went out to events, get to know people. And uh, one of the best partnerships was um, signing a strategic partnership agreement with WeWork, who then offered us uh, not only space to work, but also access to the startups that are here. And now recently also we signed a partnership with Kita, and as you know, Kita runs the whole COEX building and also this event. So another good partner to help us access the startup ecosystem. Next, care for the space. I believe space is very important and not just, you know, not just any space. I was working in Berlin and we just got an open office. It's very loud and you know, it's not really private and confidential. We offer, I would say, one of the nicest spaces. Um, I can give you an example, YouTube or Google was in our office and said it was nicer than theirs. And they were always my benchmark, right? Google office. So if they say this office uh, is better than theirs, I'm very proud of it. So um, this is the Nivea Accelerator space. It's located in Hongde. It's around 700 square meter. We choose Hongde because as, if you know Hongde, it's one of the youngest districts in Korea. Uh, very trendy, a lot of energy, creativity. And that's where we want to be, that's where we want to do innovation. On this space, we have a whole floor for us. Uh, we have some other benefits like a photo studio. Every startup has their own office and we have one lounge which connects all of the space. Uh, feel free to visit. Um, I think it's a good place for inspiration. Next, caring for the program. What we do differently than other startup accelerators is we offer or we designed a customized acceleration program. So we have building blocks which we then tailor to each of the startup needs. And it can be very different. Some startups really need distribution support. Others need R&D support. Others need investment and the space and maybe a bit of uh, mentoring. What we always do is strategic partnership agreement with Bayersdorf, which is sort of an MOU where we define all the areas of collaboration. But what is in this agreement is really depending on the startup and their needs. And I think this is the best way to also care for the startup and not just run them through a program which everyone gets. And then carrying the selection. So this one was particularly hard. Um, you also see Dirk on the, one of the judges here. Um, it was an international selection day and Korea has a lot of amazing beauty startups. We had over 200 startups which we evaluated. Um, 200 really great startups. Indie brands, personalization, beauty tech. Finally we had uh, 10 startups showing up for the selection day which we picked and then the top five have been selected to be the first batch of NX. And again, very different to other accelerators who have maybe 20 startups every three months and have a lot of quantity, we focus on quality, taking five startups for one year program, customized to them. And uh, just to spice up things, we have a small video. Um, you wanna play? Just to give you a feeling about the selection day.
Thank you very much. I hope you uh, like this video. It's um, just to give you a bit of a feeling that, you know, we are a brand company. Whatever we do, we try to make the best of it also in terms of branding. This is not just for startup collaboration. This is really to establish, I feel like, a, a mindset for innovation. And that's why also when we do this kind of programs, we also run events uh, with partners to really also expose the brand of NX. Good, and uh, the last chart today is to introduce you our top five startups, um, which have been all picked, as I said, from two, a pool of 200. And uh, they are quite different in terms of what they do. Um, on the very left, Umpa Cosmetics, Onya Pauchi in Korea, they are the third largest beauty platform. They have around 1.5 million users on their app. And what's really interesting is that they use the data and the reviews of consumers to develop cosmetics. Not like us, running focus groups and working with all kinds of traditional uh, agencies. They use their consumer data on their platform to develop products of tomorrow. Really interesting. The second one is called Limeys, and they are the first Korean startup who's bringing K-beauty to India. India so far is just a, still a very developing market, and especially for K-beauty, it's just coming up, and they have already signed up 13 brands on their platform, one of the really big ones uh, in terms of startups, who will then be sold in India. The third one is called Glow Hill, and uh, it's very well known at Gen Z, I would say millennials, because the products are very imaginative. What they develop is really focused on Instagram, right? Everything they do has to look good mobile. Um, and one of their hero products is a kind of slime mask with a galaxy texture, which you put over your face and then rip it off, and it's really nice on Instagram. Um, and this, we want to learn from the imagination. The fourth one is called Resina, and you've seen also in DX presentation. It's a beauty tech device which promises a technology where we think it's more powerful than a usual cream. It has an iFood technology, intense focused ultrasound, which really penetrates your skin deeply, a technology you can only get at skin clinics, and with this device, you can take it home. So very interesting disruptive technology. And the fifth one is called Panda, and it's different to all of the others. It's about making cosmetics fresh. But I mean, I'm saying extreme fresh, not like just saying fresh. So this guy, he's having a store, and you go there, and it takes him one minute, and you can take your cream home, right? Like a Starbucks for skincare. It's really fresh cosmetics, handmade, just in front of you, uh, only in Korea. So, yes, that's the five companies, uh, all different. Um, and we just took those five because by having only five, we can maximize care, we can maximize attention, and offer all of them the support they need to grow with us globally. Thank you very much, and we are happy to receive your questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rezek and Dirk, for sharing us the Opening Innovation Program, NX. Well, as for the last presentation of our last session, well, Saria Schwab, are you ready? Yes, please give a big hand to Sharil Schwab, the technology head of APAC Airbus, with a big hands of applause. And for the one last time, D662, in order to log in and leave comments on the slido.com. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I, I don't live in Korea, but uh, it's my first time in Korea. It's also my, my last day of my 30s. It's my 40th birthday tomorrow, so I'm very happy to spend this day with you and to see some uh, exciting things. I'm very, very in line with what I saw from our friends from uh, BMW. I'm going to show you how we, why we go for open innovation, how we do it. And in this picture, you have some sort of a summary why it's so hard for us, a, a bit like it is hard for BMW. We have this beautiful product that we develop. It takes us 10 years to develop them. And then on top of it, you want to start to use these technologies, a digital technology, a small consumer drone to do some inspection. And this, they developed using three months. The cycle time of the two products, they are completely different. How you put this kind of products, which are not as safe as the one we are used to put around our airplanes, it's a very challenging type of uh, problem. Still, this is not something Airbus is able to do because this is such a consumer type of product. And we are so, so much focused and geared towards producing this kind of big product. We need to open up and we need to partner with some other partner. So this is what we do. Uh, most of you know Airbus, but not the whole span of what we do. So Airbus, of course, we are very famous for the series of planes we are building. All of you have been traveling at one point in an Airbus. Not all, not all of you are conscious of the plane you are, you are in. 
but for a lot of us, we know the S380, for example, the biggest of all, the most comfortable of all, uh, and Korean Air, and both Korean Air and Asiana, as Asiana are operating it. But we are also doing a lot of helicopters. We are the biggest uh, helicopter uh, market. We are a leader in, uh, air, in uh, defense, defense uh, product also, being it helicopter or uh, fuel tanker or this kind of application. But most, uh, most importantly, we are trying to move towards new type of product also. You have this kind of very funny looking type of pseudo satellites, which are hovering over a particular area in, uh, over the earth to produce connectivity. We are trying to look towards uh, services type of uh, products. And th what you see here is an helicopter ready to go for anyone, a bit like a Uber service, but for a helicopter. And we've been developing this kind of solution. We are also looking towards a lot of digital type of solution. And what we call Skywise, a new brand for Airbus, is actually just an open platform for every, everybody in the aviation ecosystem to share their data. And when I say everybody, it's not only the airplane uh, operator, but also the regulation authorities, the supply chain working on it, or uh, all the way to the airport, which are operating the, operating the, moving the airplane. So this is Airbus. I will finish with this funny li little thing. We also do our own very, very own airplane for our own purposes. So you know, Airbus is a European company. We manufacture our plane uh, all over the place in Europe. So we need to move around a lot of parts, and the parts are big. So we created a big airplane, but we might as well make it fun. So this is why it has a bit of a, a whale look. So this, it's called the Beluga by uh, the name of a whale. So Airbus is big. Uh, we, we, uh, we are moving towards more internationalization, of course. 40% uh, of the order book of Airbus is actually in Asia Pacific. And it's not well uh, known well enough, but for example, Korea, is actually the first uh, customer outside of Europe for Airbus. You know, Airbus is a 50-year-old company. Four years after Airbus being founded, a, Korea, a Korean company bought the S300. So the very first Airbus plane uh, was bought outside of Europe in Korea. And now you have 200 planes which are operated by the, the biggest company in, uh, in Korea. We have uh, 20 of these uh, little planes which are operating in the, in the, in the Air Force of Korea. We have a partnership with the Korean Aerospace Agency uh, for, for Earth Observation Program for more than 20 years. We've been partnering with Sky to develop uh, two, two, two helicopters, which are produced and developed here in, uh, in Korea. Korea is one of the first adopters of this uh, S330, so this is a civil airplane reconfigured to do uh, fuel, uh, fuel refu refueling for, for airplane in the skies. And, and moreover, we are also uh, 6,000 of their job are, uh, are more or less linked to producing the aircraft here in, uh, in, uh, in Korea. And for example, the most innovative part of the S320, so the retrofit of the Sharplet at the end of the, of the wing to make it more efficient, this is a program that is taken by, uh, by Kai here in, uh, in Korea. So Airbus, Airbus is uh, very, very involved in Korea, as we should, and uh, it started in this area. And what we would like to see is how we, we evolved this relationship from the 1970s where we were our first customer, all the way to this new area of digitalization, trying to integrate new, new product in, uh, in Airbus. So I'm, I'm just putting this diagram on purpose uh, with an arrow pointing to the back. This is some sort of representation of what I call non-stop innovation. Airbus has been introducing slowly but surely, slowly because this is aerospace and we need to make everything safe, surely because we need to make it safe. Uh, we are the first one to have introduced uh, the concept of family, for example, for airplanes. So uh, once you qualify a pilot for one type of airplane, you can fly all the, others, uh, all the other airplanes in this family. We've been introducing from the 80s and the 320 all the way to, to the 350, where we have 50% of the, of, the, of the content of the plane of composite materials. So how to make new materials, more efficient materials, lighter materials all the way to, as I was saying in the, in the introduction, trying to integrate these digital technologies, this new way of doing uh, services. I'm just starting, time's up. <laughs> and uh, so, so we are trying to accelerate this, and uh, to do this, we need to go to open innovation. So I, I will just accelerate since time's up. Yeah. The, the whole logic for us to move towards this, uh, this new ecosystem is our customers, they have some units. We were discussing the, the millennials, they are, they are born with a computer, with phone in their hand, right? So they expect 
at least to have connectivity in the plane or these kind of things. Then we, we have some new competition coming in, a bit like there is a risk for the, the indie type of uh, brain for, for our friend from Bayersdorf. So we need to, in, to innovate and for this, we need to look towards new source of creativity say in the digital sector. And uh, we need to, to open up to the internationalization and go where the knowledge, knowledge is. <coughs> I will skip, so I, I, I couldn't resist to put some nice picture on what Airbus is doing, but since time's up, I skip the whole thing and I go to the jigs of what we do. So there is a lot of technologies involved in what we want to, to build. And to, to open up to the, to the world, we have put in place what we call the scouting network, a global scouting network, uh, which is all over the place in the world, in the most, uh, in the biggest, uh, in, the, in the biggest technology hotspots, say one of them uh, here, here, here in Seoul. And uh, once you, you spot uh, to, to spot some new new technologies, there is a lot of tools that are at your disposal. Of course, you can use some challenges. You can use startup days. You can use uh, so worldwide challenges. You can use some specific challenges because you want to access to specific. So I'm, I'm giving the example of New Zealand, for example, which is very big in agri-tech, in space technologies, and in uh, grand weather station and these kind of things. Uh, of course, we want to access this, so we tailor it to, to New Zealand and we have access to partners. We don't, we don't go alone, but we access the full ecosystem and we pre-select some startups like that. And then once you have selected startups, you need to do something with them. So we have our own accelerator program, a bit like was presented with uh, NX from, uh, from Bayersdorf. So the only difference, uh, our own uh, accelerator, we are mixing together the external and internal uh, startups. So it's both at the same time, intrapreneurship and extrapreneurship. And then once you have the ideas, you know, for me, open innovation is three things. Uh, first is to dis discover something. So you go out there, you go for internationally, you, 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 you collect some ideas, then you need to match it to some sort of internal opportunity. And there is several ways to do it. For example, you go out there, you find a company that is doing uh, artificial intelligence to do predictive maintenance on machining. So machining of uh, aircraft part, of course, it's important for us, but we don't do ourselves. It's the supply chain who is doing it. So how do you do it? You start to engage the supply chain. For example, you go to Malaysia. We have a huge supply chain in there. You get involved in the ecosystem. You enter in some sort of private partner, pri private public partnership to make sure that everybody is working together and collectively everybody is going to be more productive. And then you can introduce new technologies in your supply chain. Or you can uh, invest directly in the startup if it's a strategic, uh, it's a strategic asset, but it doesn't fit. It's a complement to your current uh, portfolio. So this is what we do, for example, with this company who is doing the mapping of the low Earth orbit uh, uh, staff that is here uh, out there, so that you can produce some services for the people who want to put satellites in low Earth orbit to make sure uh, there is no accident over there. Or you have some in your very own, you create your very own new business line out of an entrepreneur. So for example, how to use satellite images to serve a new vertical, which is insurance uh, where we are not working with. So basically with a change detection with satellite, you just provide a service to the insurer so that they can, uh, they can go directly, they, they, can treat, they, they can treat the claims much faster. Or you can just partner with, uh, if you cannot do it yourself, you just substitute and you go outside and you create a joint venture with them. For example, this is what we do with this one web company where we are going to put 900 satellites out there to create seamless connectivity uh, for all the parts in the world. Uh, and then basically, this is not something that Airbus can do to build 900 satellites in one, in, uh, in one year. This is not the, the size of the satellites which uh, Airbus is geared to, to produce. So you need to go outside and produce. And the last one is you need to integrate all of, the, all of it together sometimes. So you integrate this in your own program. So you have one program, what we are doing in Singapore, uh, optimizing the maintenance of the aircraft. Basically, it's for building blocks, uh, understanding the state of your plane, then deciding what you need to do with it, executing the maintenance, and then since we are regulated, you need to store everything. Collecting information, putting drones, and so and so. This is what I was saying in the introduction. This is not our job. Automating the task planning this is not our job either. It's a software uh, editor type of job. So we find a, we find some partners here. We find some partners here. We find partners. We find partners. Startups and we bring we 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 gel the whole thing gel all together and we have the open innovation in the end. We detected some company. We identified some parts where it was complementing our portfolio and then we put it all together and substituting the things we cannot do to, do ourselves by uh, putting it to the supply chain a bit like you want to do with the startups also.
try to be as fast because uh, I've been uh, rushed. Thank you so much, Ariel. And may I ask now all the speakers to join us on the stage for the panel discussions. The panel discussion will be moderated by Eugene Buff from Primary Care Innovation Consulting. So may I ask all the speakers and the moderator to join us on the stage? And we will be using, again, Slido.com in order to... Um, what, what do you prefer? Well, I can see that there are some Korean questions, so let me first go ahead and translate that first, uh, and then leave the mic to Eugene. So the first question is on Germany. Germany has, uh, Germany is the powerhouse for manufacturing, and it has the uh, long tradition as well as the uh, technological capability. But compared to US and China, um, it seems that it, it's a bit, a little behind on innovative, uh, innovative industry uh, compared to its scale of um, economy. So, what do you think of that? What's the panel's thoughts? I can start. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah, so um, we see the same development. Um, Germany is, is a country that is um, not really a poor front runner in certain technologies or in all technologies. We tend to have a look at it with a lot of risk aversity and then adopt it and try to make it perfect. Yeah? So we are usually, when it comes to very new technologies, we are usually the ones who will not do it as the first ones, but we are trying to do it as the best ones. So this is kind of the German way of engineering and the way of uh, German innovation. Um, it's not really that we are the inventors of anything that's, that's uh, totally new, um, except for, of course, the automotive industry. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for that. Um, nevertheless, I, uh, I absolutely agree. We, we really optimize things. And I mean, the whole industry 4.0 thing is an international activity and it's it's hitting us um, just as it's uh, hitting everywhere in the world right now um, so it's it's uh, something certainly that germany needs to keep up with with the speed of the world and not uh, expect to be the forerunner yes just maybe a last comment from my side because i was also spending some time living in berlin right i would say maybe for germany the most innovative city um, I think what Germany is lacking is um, really structured support for startups. I think uh, in Korea, as I have never seen such a strong government support, maybe even too much, but it's a, a really amazing what, you, what ecosystem you have here from VCs, accelerators, and so on. And in Germany, you have to really fight to get funding, to get attention. And I think um, this is not stimulating for new ideas and growth. Okay, thank you. So I guess I'll take over from now. And uh, uh, so just a quick note, why, why I was even invited to, to this panel is that uh, um, I'm actually a consultant and spent the last 20 years of uh, doing this matchmaking between the big companies and the startups and the technologies outside in both directions. So to steer this con uh, conversation, I think we have a little bit more than half an hour into the right direction. Can I have uh, uh, some uh, hands in terms of who is in the audience consider themselves as a startup or uh, technology developers uh, or uh, innovators, entrepreneurs. So everybody else is a large company? Okay, so I guess we have a good balance. So let's, uh, I think the, uh, the, uh, the next question that we see, and I think maybe let's uh, uh, hear some of the comments in terms of the uh, best practices for, so uh, for those of you in the audience who are from the large companies and trying to establish the similar programs or struggling with the similar programs. So can you give a quick uh, horror story and the success story or maybe some tips on how you deal with your internal customers within your organization? Because you are kind of, all of you are in the middle between the, the corporate 
uh, and uh, uh, we all know that the, all of those companies are, haven't been created yesterday, so there are a lot of the culture uh, and some of the snow that not invented here syndromes. Uh, so when you find something that's really, really excited, uh, what's your uh, trouble and uh, what's your uh, advice uh, tips to how to deal with it? So let me maybe start on this one. Um, I think one of the biggest learnings um, that, that we've had from the very first minute was that if an external idea comes into the company, um, we need to compress and condense this idea into a digestible format. We cannot just say, okay, here's a startup that's interesting and the, here is uh, the internal department, so please talk to each other. This just doesn't work. We need to act as a middleman. We need to, come, uh, we need to make it uh, really ideally a one-pager, the whole information of the startup, and then try to excite the internal department um, so that, that they begin pulling on it and that we're not just pushing it inside. I think this is, uh, this is really crucial and um, sometimes this is for us as technology scouts also a bit of a split sort because it feels like you become the salesman for the company, so for the, for the external company. So we are a little bit of the devil's advocate here, uh, saying um, here's a great company, please work together while we don't actually have any direct benefit or any stake in this company. Yeah, what, what I would like to add is that I've found two success factors for um, fostering internal innovations from coming from the outside. One is you have to have a very good answer to the question, why? Why do we need this startup? Why do we need this technology? Because especially in our case, we are a very healthy company. We're doing roughly 7 billion turnover per year, 15% EBITDA margin, over 4 billion in cash reserve. So we have really to give an answer to the question, why do we need this new technology? So what does it make better? What does it make cheaper? What does it make more efficient or more effective? That is one thing. The second thing is, that you have to build an internal network of intrinsically motivated innovators. Because you cannot do innovation top down. You cannot give somebody the order to be innovative or work innovative. You have to find the right people who want to be innovative, who want to work creatively on new solutions. And that is basically the secret sauce um, of every tech scout or, or every successful tech scout in the world. Can only second this. I, you know what I was saying as a concluding remark. When you do this kind of open innovation, it's finding a technology, right? But it's also matching it to the opportunity internally and to match it in. So it's easy. It's easier said than done. But you need a network internally of people who are motivated enough to display to you this kind of opportunities, and you you, you need to have a clear and concise way of. Uh, basically, the startups. It's really going to be an immediate solution to this problem anyway, <coughs> even to this opportunity. So you need to have an additional layer between the two to do the decontextualization, to put it back in the context of your own company for the people to understand how it matches this opportunity, and then maybe the magic will happen. Yeah. Cross fingers. Yeah, so you got something to add? How you sell uh, your yeah. five startups to Dirk. <laughs> yes. Um, just to add, I think what Dirk says is, is absolutely right. And um, I think usually the first key challenge is um, that people don't understand. So first you have to really involve them, right? You have to find the ones um, that really support you because uh, usually resistance comes from not understanding and this creates fear and then they will resist you, they will come with some strange answers or some process argumentation. So involving them and making them understand is key. You cannot be friends with everyone, but you have to find your key people. Um, nevertheless, so what worked for us in Korea, which is a very, I don't want to go into details, but um, don't come with an idea, just start. Right, so when we pitched this, we already had startups lined up. We had some partners ready. WeWork was ready to start with us before I presented this to the board. So it's not just like, oh, maybe we can do that. That's not enough, right? In today's, uh, at least for our company, you have to really um, show that you're passionate and you're ready to do it and you're ready to start. And uh, then support comes much faster. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So just to keep the balance, let me uh, do the next question is to, uh, in a different direction, and then we'll, uh, we'll have some of the good questions that are already up on the board. So what do you consider as the uh, prerequisites uh, for the outside technology or company uh, to, uh, to be considered? And I understand it's different between all of you, uh, and that will lead us to the next question that you don't see because it's behind you. Uh, but uh, uh, so what, what, would, what kind of makes or breaks? So the minimal uh, requirement, all the uh, necessary, uh, sufficient, 
the stage of development, uh, shape, something that the people in the audience can relate and say, yes, I'm, I fit this criteria, I need to talk to you. Yeah, I'm getting you I in trouble, so now you'll have the <laughs> line after this uh, <laughs> session. Of, uh, I will become with a very disappointing question. I don't really have a set of criteria. Uh, that's, because uh, that's Airbus a is such a big company, you, the, the kind of opportunities is going to be immense. In the presentation from BMW, I remember you had several uh, internal customers. One of them is internal processes. Internal processes, you have a little bit of margin than what is going to be on the product in the end. So if it's, for example, uh, retrofitting some machine with IoT stickers, or this kind of things, you have plenty of startups working on this. You don't need the same level of maturity as, this, as planting the same stickers on your airplane later. So you can start to plan a roadmap with any level of maturity for technology, as long as it's matching some sort of opportunity internally. Well, actually, I would like to refer to Dirk's presentation at this point, <laughs> um, because uh, he made a very good point when he said that uh, accelerators are a fantastic uh, pre-filter for, for startups to work with. Um, actually, I would add, in addition to that, uh, VCs are an even better pre-filter, um, because they actually put a lot of money into the, into the startups. Um, so for the startup garage, we really have a very fixed set of criteria which I'm not sure if you remember from the video, is for us um, that the startup needs to have a prototype, it needs to have graduated from an accelerator program or um, has some, um, some, some uh, funding already in place from, an, uh, from a VC. Um, we need to make sure that or we, we want the startup to be still um, primarily in the head of founders and we want to have a team of roughly at least four to five full-time employees um, for the startup garage. Uh, um, uh, one person company is not really the right target simply because the risk for us that the startup uh, drops out later is, is too high and as I said we're not really investing into the startup itself but rather into the technology and how we can use it. Um, and maybe from our, from my perspective because we had a selection of 200 companies right and selecting 200 companies is a lot of work. Um, so first we started now a very tangible concept I can share with you uh, maybe it's inspirational um, so we first started with a venture capital kind of Excel sheet to go through the companies. No one understood this, right? There was too many details, too many questions. So we later did, we broke it down into four P's. And in marketing, we like four P's, if you know the framework. Um, in terms of startup selection, four P's for us, all similar weighted. Number one, people, who's leading the company, right? Number two, performance. How have they been performing in the past, right? Do they have sales, do they have a prototype, what's going on there? Then potential. What will be in the future? What will be together with buyers of the potential that we can have? And the last one, the last P is price, which refers to the valuation of the company, which then is more the venture capital framework. But by having those four P's, people internally understood it. And again, going to the question of resistance and so on, once people know, ah, this is your four P's, I understand your framework, I support you. So this worked for us. Okay, well, I think that's a, that's a very good uh, introduction to this question that you haven't seen. And uh, it starts specifically from uh, you guys at NX uh, ac uh, Accelerator. So what exactly the business model? How you expect those companies to be uh, a part of uh, uh, kind of uh, fighting the potential disruption? And then I think this, uh, uh, the same question, I mean, implies for you. I mean, uh, uh, Julian, you slightly, uh, you just uh, reiterated what the relationship is with uh, the companies. But uh, again, on a big scale as a, for the corporate uh, business model, I still uh, think that the question remains. But let's start from uh, the biz door. Uh, I think that's a um, very good question. It's hard to predict what's in the future in the next uh, 50 years. Um, I think what we see already now, um, by lining out the partnership agreements, the first benefits for our business model is that, of course, we can learn from the innovations the startups have. And the startup innovations, they know it themselves, they're limited in terms of resources and markets they can go through. So working with us, they can have an innovation which might work in, in Vietnam or the US, and together with Firestop, we can bring this innovation to the whole world. And this will, in the end, also help our business model to be a disruptor ourselves. But um, honestly speaking, so the target for NX is not to acquire those companies. We just take minority shares. We take, take a small piece, give them their control, let them operate, and um, we believe that investing into them and letting them disrupt others, this is the future business model. And who knows, maybe in uh, 50 years when we've been running this many, many times and we've got hundreds of startups going through, maybe it's not buyer stock brands who will be leading the future, but startup brands, which we are investing in, which we are nurturing, which we are supporting. Maybe this is our future business model. Um, we will see. Okay. So you, you yeah, maybe to add the global perspective. 
Um, we are in, in a situation right now where we have a strategy of fading in, fading out. So we want to foster our current business model as long as we can, as good as we can. But as we know that there will be some sort of disruption coming, we are trying to build the startup ecosystem inside of Biosurf and um, experiment with new business models. Uh, for example, we just um, put live um, a digital midwife, uh, which is basically a chatbot that will answer all questions around pregnancy, childbirth, and having the first 12 months of a baby child, which again has nothing to do with skincare anymore, but it has a lot to do with our core values, point one, and our core target groups, which are families, point, point two. So these are the two constraints where we see this might be one anchor point for our future business model. It has to fit to our core um, values and it has to fit to our core target groups. Yeah, do you, do you guys want to add something? Yeah, I mean, for us, um, as we are not an accelerator, of course, the question for the business model, why are we doing this, uh, comes up very often. The, the people come up to me and say, why are you spending money on startups when you're not actually benefiting from when they actually scale? But our motivation is a different one. We want to, to produce or support the, the production of our future suppliers. We want to nurture our supplier landscape so that um, we can widen the space of innovation from our existing suppliers to also these innovative startups. Something from Airbus? You saw in the end of my presentation, I was just going through all the models of engagement that are possible, and basically there are thousands of them, but the example of OneWeb, for example, is very good. It's a, in the end, it's a joint venture between Airbus and the, the partner. It can be like like was described by BMW, we put them in the supply chain of our own supply chain or in our supply chain. So for example, these startups that are working on 4.0 technology to improve the, the production of aircraft, Airbus were very happy to have this uh, growing faster and growing worldwide so that they can support the whole supply chain so that our planes are cheaper and more efficient. So of course, in the end, it's supporting us. So it's, uh, it's worth uh, investing. We have... Uh, internal startups that are going outside of the company uh, by themselves. So intrapreneurs which are developing a solution for us and then afterwards they go outside of the company. And then we have also in a different way, but all the, all the ecosystem of services around the operation, operation of the aircraft. Of course, we are, some, we are offering a bit like for uh, Bayersdorf, some sort of new market for the startup because they start to develop a solution somewhere in France. Maybe they manage to sell it to Air France, but it's going to be impossible for them to market it to all the airlines in the, in the world, whereas we have uh, quite a big marketing network for all the airlines for bigger uh, volumes, say, and we can open this kind of uh, capabilities, uh, this, this uh, book, to, to the startups. Okay, okay, thank you. So I have uh, uh, another question kind of to continue, and then maybe we'll get more uh, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I do have a few in, in my sleeve uh, uh, if, if we don't. But my question now for you uh, guys is, so what's the balance and how you operate uh, proactively versus uh, reactively? Meaning uh, how actively are you uh, running around those hallways and, and looking for companies versus you sitting and after this presentation, waiting the line to form outside of your office door. Um, for our startup scouting, it's roughly, I would say, 70-30. Uh, so 70 is the active scouting, where we attend conferences. Um, so this is, in the past 18 months, my 61st uh, conference uh, and, and startup event that I was uh, attending personally. So we do a lot of active uh, scouting where we go to conferences, go to demo days, go to events, go to networking, meetups and, and stuff like that to actually really meet the startups and have one-on-one -on -one talks because you cannot really find out what a startup is about and what the team is about without meeting them one-to-one. -one, huh? So desktop research is only 30% of what we do and of course we use external partners. Additionally, if we have a very specific problem, problem we will approach those specific search partners um, who will then um, look into the databases and, and give us um, some ideas on where to search next. But the, the overall um, ratio is 70-30. Okay. It's very similar for us, 70-30, I would say, though I'm not attending that many conferences, <laughs> thankfully. Um, uh, but Well, that's probably for the organizers of this one. So you need to... Uh, multiply the number of conferences because he's just in Korea, right? <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm very happy not to attend so many actually. Um, but uh, I absolutely agree that you have to meet the startups one-to-one. -one. 
And um, I mean, that's, that's also the reason why we are, why I am based here in Korea, to make sure that we have the opportunity not to just go there for two days uh, for a conference and try to meet some staffs, but actually really schedule over um, the entire year when, when we meet which startup and when we start which project. Um, as an advice, if you are a startup really for that, that means try to get your message out there. Not just, the, not just the conferences, but also the internet channels, because desk research is part of us, uh, of our work as well. We often look online, we see what press releases are there. Um, we, we try to monitor the entire scene from both on the show floor as well as from the computer screen. So I'm not exactly sure what the, what the cut. <laughs> But we have a full department we, which is doing back, uh, back job. Back in I was asking for exact numbers, so it's yeah. Dirk who set up the, <laughs> the stage with that. It's the Germans. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> the, the, the literature survey, the part where you collect information, actually we have some requests regularly once a month from our technical uh, experts who say, okay, I want to work on uh, IoT for production in Malaysia, very specific, for example. And then you have a full, uh, full team who's doing some uh, internet search on this. So you need to be out there. If not, uh, nobody will see you, right? Uh, the, it's, it's never enough to do it just uh, behind, the, behind the screen, right? So one of the models I was showing also, we are getting involved in local ecosystem, in local uh, public-private partnerships, eh, where you have naturally a lot of things that are going through. For example, so I was showing our uh, Malaysian example. We have a collaborative research center. We are part also of the co cooperative research center in uh, Australia, so, they have a, so uh, it's, it's a good way to be exposed, for example, to the space uh, ecosystem in Australia, which is very booming. We are partnering uh, in China, in Singapore, in, uh, in Australia, in Canada, in similar type of ecosystem, where you get to see a lot of people coming in, and then you start to understand what they are doing, one to one, and you start to imagine yourself, is, does it match with an opportunity in terms of you know, Okay, well, thank you. So I don't know, any, any additional questions from the audience? I don't see any updates on the screen, so. Uh, but nobody's sleeping, so it's, it's, it's also good. So if there are no questions, I have uh, probably uh, uh, almost, uh, we still have uh, time for a few more, but I, I, I think my last question would be, so you are kind of the outside face of your companies and all your companies are global. Uh, so you're with all those conferences to attend, and so you uh, should be bumping into your competitors. Uh, so how you as an external people uh, uh, kind of uh, deliver those messages and try to differentiate, uh, uh, tr uh, and uh, are you afraid that uh, you are direct competitors, and I'm sure we can all name for all of you uh, uh, pretty obvious direct competitors. Uh, so do you afraid or have you seen them starting copying your approach? Uh, and if yes, uh, uh, so how, what's, uh, in general, what's your look at the competition with you so openly uh, uh, projecting the interest of your companies to, uh, to new technologies and new businesses? And I'm sorry I didn't let you time to prepare for that. <laughs> Should we turn the cameras I, off? So I that start, nobody <laughs> it's very easy, there's only one competitor, right? So we know each other, for, for sure. There are topics on which- Those that should not be named, right? <laughs> It starts with a B. <laughs> we are very happy to cooperate on uh, generic topics. You know, the aerospace industry, for example, we took some very big commitment in reducing the greenhouse gas emission and all of this. So the whole industry as a whole decided that we are going to reduce by 50% the CO2 emission by 2050. Whereas by this time, the overall fleet will have increased threefold or fourfold. So imagine the step it is. So if you want to take this type of commitment, there is a need of some sort of internal, uh, not internal, but some sort of agreement between all the actors that on some topics we're going to work together on sustainability, definitely one of them, electrification type of technologies. Then if you go to the supply chain, how we are, we are getting the supply chain to be more efficient. The supply, supply chain is rarely exclusive. It's always serving both of us at the same time. So when, you, when a supplier becomes more efficient, it's also more efficient for the competitor. Well, this is life, huh? <laughs> and then what, what is very critical for what we would like to keep uh, internal, 
I'm not too worried either because, you, you know, like I said, the technology by itself is nothing. It's a technology matched mm -hmm. to an opportunity and to your own processes. And if you start earlier, you integrate this in your processes and you have a key differentiator, whereas the technology itself, of course, you can, uh, the competitor can acquire it also. Mm -hmm. So initially, as I mentioned earlier during, during my um, speech, um, we, of course, try to keep it a little bit under the radar of the competitors because obviously the competitors are working in the same field and they are also talking to the startups. Um, nevertheless, the moment we really have had the first shot with the, with the startup, it may be actually very interesting for us, for the startups to also work for the competition because of the scaling effects. We are a relatively small vehicle manufacturer in terms of numbers compared to Volkswagen, compared to Hyundai. And um, if a startup creates a technology that can be used with a competition that's very similar to, to what you said, um, then uh, in the end it may get cheaper for all of us uh, just by increasing the numbers of the product the startup makes. Very interesting. Uh, yes, um, it's a difficult question, but um, I would uh, first... You have a few more than one competitor, I'm afraid. Yes, I think the, the first part is the so question, uh, what is the, exactly, what is your competitor, right? And I think um, saying the other established brands are competitors is not really looking into the future. What we see is the growth is coming from small brands, from independent people like you and me who launch their products and start selling it. And we are not competing with the small brands. We are really looking for partnership, and that's why we started this. So I think at Bayerstorf now we're changing maybe from a mindset of competition to a mindset of partnership, to opening up. Um, this is maybe the first part of the answer. The second part is if someone wants to copy what we do, right? Um, I'm not worried in a way because our program has a lot of the Bayerstorf DNA in it, right? From the people, from the way we design the program. You see it's very unique from the way we build partnerships. And um, this, I think, also defends us from imitation by really building something authentic, which is really fitting to Nivea and the brand. Um, and that's why I'm very confident uh, also looking forward. Great. Well, thank you. Is that something there? Right? Yeah. Um, basically, um, what we do in global scouting is a um, simple old strategy. Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. And this especially goes for all these small indie brands that we are working with, where we try to really establish corpora corporations, where we say, okay, we can bring something to the table that the startups don't have yet. For example, distribution in 170 countries of the world, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, really a big asset for each and every startup. Even though they are sort of a com competitor, they can become sort of a frenemy for us. Uh, so um, this is the strategy that we are um, advocating there. Um, in terms of the, the big competitors, um, the, the old other legacy companies in, in, in skincare and personal care, um, of course we are all fishing the same pond, right? And it's a decision from the start of what they want. Yeah? And um, the assets are almost the same, yeah? but then it's for a question, for example, of culture and people. Yeah? And so um, this is the way we try to differentiate, where we say, okay, we have this caring culture um, that we can even apply to startups um, that we work with. Uh, and this is something that others do not have. So we are a we company, others are an I company. Uh, so this is um, a main differentiator for us. Well, great. Thank you very much. So uh, last chance, any more questions uh, from the audience? Well, if not, I think uh, it's a good time to thank uh, everybody and I think uh, and a big uh, kudos to the organizers to uh, combine such a great panel. I had nothing to do with it. I was just invited to uh, tease them and ask the questions. Uh, and I think the quick learning is that we have probably the most diverse type of uh, uh, markets that you can imagine from uh, skincare. I mean, uh, you can find something between airspace and uh, automotive. Uh, they, they both have wheels, but that's about uh, probably where the comparison is. And uh, uh, so the good thing is that these are uh, very, very interesting and yet very similar approaches in terms of how to deal with uh, external innovation and how incorporate it and make sure that the, the, these large companies, these very, very large companies, multinational companies, based their, find their innovation locally and apply it to the global markets. So I hope that uh, uh, you will learn something. Uh, and uh, uh, I do hope for you that there is a line outside waiting for you uh, when you will be entering with some great uh, suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.